Hey, thanks for joining us again. I am Jenny Gold, a former uh, Valley Film Festival alum, filmmaker, and I'm meeting Benjamin South. Do you like to be called Ben or, or Benjamin? Let's go with Ben. It's, it's more casual. I, I, uh -huh. nice informal. That's great. So obviously we don't know each other. It's funny because earlier I had an interview with somebody who actually had worked for me for 12 years. Wow. <laughs> and and uh, yeah. we were introduced as uh hey meet this filmmaker i'm like yeah actually i know him but uh Maybe that was 12 years i mean that must have been a pretty easy interview for both of you yeah well uh you know it was fun but uh this is gonna be fun too because i don't know you at all so give me a brief uh overview uh, how did you start uh, your filmmaking journey yeah sure so um as you can probably hear i've got an accent so i'm originally from uh from england from a small county called surrey just outside london it's not that small but I, I, sorry yeah sorry <laughs> uh, haven't heard that one before jenny um, <laughs> so uh originally i'm from there i've been to the south too just have um, you Where, whereabouts no i'm just from oh. Ben south oh I, I can't keep up it's the jet lag. i know it's horrible today you got me on a really bad day you're full <laughs> of it um but yeah i've been told that before <laughs> I'm, uh, so so I, I lived there for 18 years and then um, I kind of got into film when I was attending Hertwood House, which is an A-level college, which is kind of the equivalent to your last two years of high school uh, here in the States. And um, they have a really amazing media department. And under Luke and a couple of other people, I kind of fell in love with the other side of the camera. And um, that's kind of what started my, my journey with that. And then a school called New York Film Academy came knocking to... Hurtwood and uh, obviously they're based here in Burbank and I decided to to move out here and go to film school for for three four years so that kind of brought me out here and then I started uh, at New York Film Academy and started making projects and making movies and and then in my spare time interning anywhere I could at um, some production companies and post houses and 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 such so I could kind of learn anything from development through to post and I was lucky to work a couple of uh, small studios and stuff while I've been out here and then really as a director I've just sort of been making the projects through NIFA and then after that sort of branching out after this but the arc which is at Valley Film Festival is my second film actually to go to Valley Film Festival um, my intermediate film at, at film school No Child Left Behind went there in 2019 and then this being my thesis film um, it's really lovely to be coming back to to Valley with this and kind of to finish off my story with NIFA that really started everything for me so so yeah it's um that's kind of me in a nutshell and it's been a it's been a kind of crazy four or five years when you throw a pandemic in there as well so but yeah I wouldn't change it wouldn't change it for the world when did um you first conceive of the arc um but the arc came around a, a long time ago now so there's someone who I worked with for a while his name's um A.M. Khalifa and while I was at Hurtwood, actually, uh, I got introduced to him and he, he's based in Italy or, or Sydney for most of the time. And he's an author and he was doing this book on on London and, and tourism. And, and they needed someone to go into London and, and try and interview people. And it, it was a book about tourism, but by people that live in London. So kind of a different spin on the, the usual tourist book. And that was great on paper, but you try and stop some busy Londoners when they're going from A to B day to day to get some interviews and you get some responses that I can't repeat probably over Zoom. So um, that was that was eye opening for the pair of us and we, we really got to know each other and he's uh, he's done really well with his own novels. But, um, you know, fast forward a year or so, he kind of approached me and said, look, I've got this book called virus at the time the book was called and he said i've i've turned that into a pilot would you want to take a read and i was like absolutely i'll take a read so i, I read the pilot and fell in love with it and it was still called virus at the time um and i said i think this is gonna work really well for the pair of us because this was just at the time when i had to start thinking about my thesis and the first act of the pilot we thought lent itself really nicely to uh to, to its own story because it kind of had a beginning middle and end and we thought well what a, what a great way to showcase what this entire pilot is and also a great genre film and a great standalone film so from that we said okay well, well, well let's take this and develop it and so we we worked in a process over probably about six months just working on the script and getting it to a point that we felt like it was still close to what was originally conceived in the pilot but it's standalone thing uh, so it was far enough removed that it felt like a short film 
and then that was sort of when would that have been that would have been summer of 2019 and then I started prep for the arc which was uh, originally meant to shoot in March of 2020 in Los Angeles so a very different film altogether um, and I started prep with my longtime collaborator, Scotty, who was my line producer on this and a producer, but a uh, longtime friend as well. And we worked together for about six months on, on a student budget and, and just kind of getting, getting through everything that we could and pulling in all the favours. And we, we got to a point where on March, you know, March 10th, we were ready to go. We, we were planning to shoot that next week. That was the slot we were given and they gave us a lot of support. Um, and then COVID happened. And I remember vividly the Thursday before we got shut down on the Friday, all the teachers, well, not all of them, but some of the teachers being like, oh, don't worry, you'll yeah, probably still shoot, it'll be fine. Uh, little did I know that two weeks later, I would be shipped back to the UK to sort of wait out what would be a pandemic with my parents, because I didn't fancy staying in an apartment for six months. So went back there and really didn't know where I was going to be. And then uh, my DP is actually from the UK, so I kind of had my core team there and Scotty's, you know, we live in a world where you can call people and FaceTime people. Um, and then we saw an opening in the UK that kind of, kind of to their detriment, the UK opened up a little bit too quickly in the summer of, of 2020. And we saw an opportunity to shoot in late August. So I called Scotty, I called Eamon, the, uh, the writer, and I spoke to Tom and I said, guys, call me crazy, but we're moving this production to the UK and we're gonna do the prep work that we did in six months and six weeks. So, and that's exactly what we did. And, and we created a whole new film, whole new uh, crew, whole new cast, uh, kept the key players, of course, on the production side. And, and then it turned into something that we think was for the better. It has silver linings everywhere. And uh, we, we just felt so lucky to be able to shoot in a pandemic, but also just all of the uh, advantages we got of being in London at that time was, was amazing. And we think it's, uh, it's a story that we can only see in London from now on. So that's really cool. It, it certainly added to, to the production value and the whole feel. I can't even imagine what it would be like if it was set in LA. Right, it's, it's yeah. And because a, a lot of my references as well were, were Black Mirror, were a lot of these UK set sort of dystopian sci-fi worlds that that just were so English to their core. And I, you know, I, I couldn't see it in any other way at this point. And, I, you know, the, the whole thing was set in a hotel at a time when the hospitality sector was on its knees. So yeah. we were given the amazing opportunity to basically take over Wotton House, which is the hotel that kind of showcases the entire film. And it, it's little things like that that just made our lives amazing. And, and it was we're just so fortunate in what otherwise was quite a dire circumstance, really. So Did you have any trouble getting, I don't know, permits or permission because of the pandemic where people like, I mean, here now, with everyone sort of got a protocol, you know, you know what you're doing as far as on set um, for, you know, the the safety, you know, people and all that. Yeah. At that we, time, it was probably very early. So yeah, did you just wing it or? It was. I mean, you know, I've, I've been fortunate enough at the moment to be working as a second AD on some features. And it, like you said, it's very much, you know, we've got our COVID officer. We You test by this date, you test regular and all of that sort of thing. And it's very mapped out. And even at that time in the US, they, they had a plan and, and NIFA had a plan as well. But what differed was in the UK, you, you weren't required to test. It was just temperature checks at that time because we were following the guidance from the British um, Film Board or Film Commission or, or whatever they're called. Um, so we followed, but it, it was just a little bit more lenient in the UK. And as long as you had your, you know, your temperatures were fine, you were regularly checking that and um and you kind of maintain distancing everyone had a mask on and and all of that sort of thing then that satisfied the need for the uk and so although it felt kind of very scary to a lot of us because it's the first job that any of us had done in the covid sort of world um it actually worked out really fantastically well and we were just although we had a covid office officer of type it wasn't it wasn't quite as ironed out at that point, I don't think. But, you know, we just had someone that would do all of the temperature checks and write it all down. And then we'd send it off to NIFA so they could get a thumbs up on that as well. The wristband system that a lot of sets adopt. And, um, you know, if anyone felt unwell, then we obviously would have sent them home and touch wood. And luckily we were 
we got around that but it you know even down to the food right we, we made the decision to to individually pack everything and, and craft service to individually pack everything just to kind of make sure that we weren't going to fall in any holes that didn't need to be and, and so everyone else felt safe as well that, that was also really important to us yeah so, um so tell me about the visual effects have you, uh, had you done any visual effects before or first, yeah first visual effects project for me and it was it was eye-opening because john Al, alvord our um visual effects supervisor and long-term friend of scotty the our producer um he's done a lot of these and a lot of um visual effects work that's gone on to tribeca and some other wonderful festivals so he you know he he is a veteran in, in that sense and um Originally in LA, he was going to be on set and, and supervise for us, right? So to make sure that they had all the measurements they needed, to make sure the green screen and the blue screen was fine. And then when we decided to move to London, he was like, oh, so <laughs> we kind of, me, the DP, uh, the, uh, the ACs, the, you know, anyone that was going to be there, we kind of took a crash course from him in visual effects. And he basically was like, this is everything I need this is what you're gonna to have to do with blue screen. This is kind of the lights that you're gonna need. Otherwise it's gonna give me reflections and, and all this stuff. And I think what's the craziest thing about all of it is we had such a, uh, what I would call a hodgepodge setup for all of our blue screen stuff. I mean, if you saw, if you saw the blue screen that we had, I mean, it was terrible, but it, it did the job just about. Um, and, and John just kind of took it and just ran with it. And, and John and Joey, his, his kind of visual effects um, guy who does a lot of the actual work were, were just unbelievable and, and really guided me through it. And it was, it was amazing. And I, I feel like, I don't feel like I'm a VFX pro at this point, but I didn't even know what the word plate was at the time. I was like, what, well, what's that guys? <laughs> um but yeah absolutely blown away by what they were able to achieve on the budget and time constraints that we had i was just flabbergasted really well you, you got me on the the bullet shot i really liked it it was a lot of fun great. it was a great shot great choice um yeah so going back a little bit like what got you first interested in being a filmmaker before the the high school that you had gone to what what was it that i see a lot of posters on on your wall um i think um I, I, as a very young boy i really wanted to be an actor so i was always immersed in that sort of world of entertainment i i, I did a lot of dancing for a while I, I did acting and all that sort of thing you know at the small level doing school plays doing stuff like that and i, I just loved it i love the entertainment world um and funny enough harry potter that's on my back wall i think i would be uh, doing it a disservice if I didn't mention it because that that really was my childhood just in terms of of movies and stuff like that and it was it was something that I maybe necessarily couldn't put my finger on but was always immersed in that world you know I love musicals whether it's the West End so just the entertainment industry in general um, always excited me and then I always had these sort of broad visions and and, and ideas about things and as I kind of took my way through things I would I, I just found it a very natural progression and to say I fell into it wouldn't be the wrong word because I, I always felt like I was in that world and there was no kind of other way for me to go and it was just a very natural way for me to go and I've always enjoyed working with a team and, and, and being a team leader and inspiring people and um, you know whenever I take on a project I try and make my vision as clear as I can and I think um, that's what I love as well is just getting everyone in and us all achieving this one goal so yeah i think it was that that desire from a young age to be a performer of type of a performer of sorts and 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 then to direct just came naturally to me really just to kind of make that hop over to the other side and um so yeah it kind of a lot of jigsaw puzzles coming together i felt like do you see the future of your career being in los angeles or being back home or what do you i mean because there's a lot of great shows coming out of the bbc also I mean, Jenny, if I could tell you, I, I mean, I've just spent the last three weeks at home with my family in the UK and the, the sort of internal turmoil that I feel like I'm going through at the moment of, of where to be and what a lovely, you know, position to be in. Because like you said, there's so much amazing stuff happening in the UK. Marvel just renewed their lease. Dis, you know, the actual Disney productions are there as well. Bond is there and all, a lot of the top Apple TV shows and Prime shows are there. So you know best of both worlds really and I think I, I I'm here for the time being so that's where I'm going to put all of my effort into and I'm I'm kind of that sort of person that wherever I am 
I'm just going to put it all in. But I think long term, I, I do see myself going back to the UK and hopefully doing some projects over there because it, it, it kind of just has a slightly different feel for me. And it's, it's really interesting because crews work really differently, I find, in the UK to the US. And, and neither are bad and, and neither are better. It's just there's two very different ways of doing it. Um, and I love both. And I, I just feel incredibly fortunate to be able to not pick and choose at times, but have the option that maybe both could be at home and, and, and both can work. Well, you um, would be the first person that has had a career in both both uh, places. Right. Yeah. I, I think it's um, it's becoming more and more common. And um, so I wouldn't change the fact that I've managed to set myself up here and have a base here. And I think that's invaluable to kind of learn the American side of it while also still, you know, like with this film, The Ark, being able to go back there and do production and, and fit right into that system as well. So I just watched the show on Netflix, um, The Movies That Made Us, which was talking about James Cameron shooting aliens. Yep. Have you seen that? And I have, how yeah. He couldn't stand the tea time breaks, I guess, the cruise. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, tea is, tea is a sacred thing. So... <laughs> You got it. Even if it's a five minute pit stop, they're going to thank you for it. So and especially we felt that on on the arc because at 3 a.m. in in the rain that was just even for an English person, it was it was <laughs> a little hot rain and it was cold. And uh, tea and coffee saved a lot of people's bacon on, on that movie and, and got people going at 3 a.m. So. I, I understand the, the necessity for the tea and the coffee breaks, I have to say. So maybe for people that haven't seen that show yet, the uh, movies that made us, tell, tell me about the, the tea and coffee breaks, what time they happen for everyone who's used to Los Angeles or the United States uh, production work. Well, we work I've got a lot of time in, in the, in the, um, in the workday. In the workday. I mean, I, I, Remind me again, I, I can't remember what- well, It's every next. six hours that we have to eat uh, and yeah. have the lunch break or the penalty if you don't. Yeah. So I don't know. Um, I think he's in between there, right? Probably, it might be. I mean, I think uh, some people like their tea every every 10 minutes. I won't lie to you. <laughs> um, I, I had some people that was just cereal tea drinkers. So <laughs> um, yeah, I, I think we, we kind of followed a- because I have done a lot of work here, we kind of followed the US system in that way that we took our breaks every six hours. And then um, we, we because of the, the hours we were doing and stuff, we, we decided not to go over 11 hours if we could help it, really, just because yeah. people's sanity. And I think I'm glad yeah. we did because there's obviously a, a clear movement at the moment to try and do yeah, something. I, like that. I did an action film in my first feature and I made a deal that just because we wanted to, we wouldn't go over 10. And it was hard. Yeah. It was really hard, yeah. but um, it's doable. I, I think, you know, moving forward, I, I would try and do the same thing. I, I think if you set that precedent, you set that rule, it's hard, but you can, you can adhere to it. And I think you'll get a lot more out of the day. You do. I would give one suggestion. If you do it, give yourself a, in the deal one over. Say so like what we're, we're going to stick to it, but if there's an emergency, we get one over because I had no overs and it was really tough. Yeah, but, you know, I, I, sometimes... I, I guess you got to, they're breathing down your neck at nine hours and forty five minutes, and you're yeah. like, I just, I just need half an hour, guys. I, ju I just, yeah, need half an hour. yeah. yeah. It, it, if it's yeah. if it's something really important, like you're not going to have that location again, you want you want a one one break. So, yeah, but yeah. um. So what's next for you? That's a great question. I, I've been really fortunate enough at the moment to be working as a second AD, kind of uh, on a lot of crews to gain some more experience. But for myself personally, I've just written a rom-com um, with my girlfriend, actually. We, we're such big fans of the Richard Curtis world of rom-coms about time, which is on my wall, you know, Notting Hill, uh, Four Weddings and a Funeral. And we think it's about time that we see another one of those. So we've written a a rom-com uh, about some two English people that uh, meet in America, actually. And it's kind of that unrequited love story. And, and we're really proud of it. And it's, it's a great feature. And, and we really think that that's going to be what we're going to try and put our eggs in the basket and get that moving, really. Is your girlfriend English that lives in America and you met here? Uh -huh. Yeah, so we met, 
we've met in America and it's kind of, it's not that the story is about us, but the concept, everyone we talked to, they were like, wow, what a, what a great story. And so we just thought as a concept alone, what a great story. And so we kind of took it from that and then, and then created our own world out of that essentially. And yeah, we're really proud of it. So you're writing and directing and producing, which uh, hat, I don't know if you do edit. Did you edit the arc in uh, UK or here? It was here actually, and with someone who I've worked with a couple of times now, Mitch Martin, who is just wonderful. Um, and, and he handled all the, uh, the picture edit and then we passed it over to Jake Keller for the color and finish and just smashed it as well. So yeah, great little posting I've put together. And, and Chris, I'll have to mention, who's on our sound designer, just, yeah, just elevated it massively. And Christoph, who did our music. Are these people so, you met through the New York Film Academy or just in other work? other work actually just through networking and um just th that side of things because i i always as soon as i moved here i thought it was incredibly important to try and branch out as much as i could and start meeting people and i i'm very happy that i did because i was really fortunate enough, enough to meet these guys who are just amazing so um if did can you think of like the worst day on the arc and then the best day quite easily yeah i, I think i can um i so worst in the sense that it was just it was crazy not worse in the sense that i didn't enjoy it because truthfully i actually loved every minute and i've been on some sets that i have not loved every minute so i felt really lucky to, to be able to have that experience where everything felt fun and enjoyable but it was um really tricky because it's that scene where they go around the car and originally it's towards the end of the film and this kind of uh not to spoil it, but uh, Herbert, our lead, kind of storms out at this point and then Jacinda kind of chases him and then they have this scene that goes around the car and then they end up at the front of the car. And that's all I'll say. But um, we kind of envisioned it in this one up and uh, we brought the steady cam in and this was the only day we were having steady cam. It was one of those sort of days. And we did our light set up and it was a pretty elaborate light set up because of how dark it was and how many lights we needed and where they needed to move. And it was a big piece of space. But what uh we didn't account for his shadows and things like that so we started blocking it and every time we blocked it there were just shadows everywhere because we weren't able to afford an overhead rig for, for the outside lights so i said okay that's that's fine guys just give me give me five minutes and i was like i i don't know what i'm gonna do so we we cut it up into just segments from that point on and and we just found cut points the whole way through but what that meant was on the slate we were down in sort of um r or s by the end of that scene when originally we thought it was a one -er. so <laughs> and obviously you want a couple of takes for each for each bit so it just it was just an incredible time crunch and and then england being England, the rain came out and we just had to embrace it towards the end and it was it was just stressful but then again it's another silver lining because we think that scene that's definitely probably my favorite scene in the entire entire film that sort of movement around the around the car before we get to the climax there and i think uh, a lot of guys on the crew and in the post team kind of echoed the same thing so a silver lining and i think our um the best day might i, I think i might say that's the best day as well because although it was so stressful and stuff it's the most memorable day that sticks out by by a long way and we did kind of our big opening drone shot that day as well and um, we, that was the one time, the only location move we had was onto the rooftop. Um, and that's actually my, my mum, of all people, uh, stepping in there in that scene. I, my, my entire family are basically in this movie as well. Um, <laughs> but my mum stepped in and smashed it on the rooftop and she always said she wanted a roll. So, so yeah, she, she did herself proud there, I think. Well, there you go. It's a family affair. So is there a director uh, in the business that you most admire and want to kind of have a style like or? Yeah, I think uh, I think at the moment there's kind of two that really stick out for me over the past um, probably five, 10 years. And that's uh, Denis Villeneuve. I, I always butcher his last name, but I'm going with that. And uh, the wonderful Sam Mendes, I would say. So those two guys, I just, I, I look up to massively. Their films for me are almost picture perfect. And I, uh, I've seen a, almost all of their films recently in the cinema and it's when I watch them and I kind of sit there and go wow this this is why I want to make movies just because it's I find it it's, it's spine tingling and it makes the hair stand up on your neck and, and that's what what I look for and I just think 
they're so every single thing they do in their movies is so motivationally driven and I think that's something that I really aspire to do with everything so yeah just those two guys in particular for me are, are really up there well I don't think we could stop on a better note than that thank you so much for joining the Valley Film Festival with The Arc, uh, which is screening Thank Sunday, you, and for joining me with this interview. It's a pleasure to meet you. I'm sure Thank you're going to have a great career ahead of you. Um, so thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you, Jenna. I really appreciate it. And uh, yeah, looking forward to Valley Film Festival. So thanks to Tracy and, and all those guys as well. Awesome. All right.